have on you. Hey, can we add Nathan to your prayer list? It's my coworker's husband. Okay. They found a mass. Oh, okay. She doesn't want anyone to know. Okay. But she said I could have my prayer pray for her. She doesn't okay. they don't believe. Okay. So right. they're not sure what it is. Okay. How much how much uh, influence do you think your friends have on you? Back in the day a lot. Today hardly any. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I guess yeah, so back in the day. We're forming our uh, social relationships oh. and um, <laughs> and what we're doing. Yeah. So, so, some of our friends, some of our friends may have introduced us to our wives back then too. Ah. Uh, yeah that that would be a positive, right? Yep. So that had a great influence on your life. <laughs> I, I guess that's what you're saying. Absolutely. <laughs> I think if you have a close, um, close church friends, I think they certainly have an influence on your life. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think too. I mean, yeah, that the, your friends at church have a different influence on your life than maybe your friends at work, and yeah, right. Okay. Go ahead. Why do you think peer pressure is so powerful? Uh, no. You want to be, be part of the group. Yeah. Yeah, no one wants to be alone. Yeah. And you're young, you just, you want to be, it's a popularity thing, is that who do you want to be seen with? <clears throat> More yeah, than that's, I think. Yeah. That's why they call it the formative years. Yeah. yeah. And when you get older, uh, I think you're a little... Uh, yeah, I, I know you're much more careful about the friends you keep. We spent a lot of time on this topic with the guys that are addicts and uh, alcoholics. And, uh, you know, uh, they're obviously much more comfortable when they're hanging around other addicts. Uh, and it's very hard for them to break away from that. Uh, you know, they always say, well, you know, a lot of these, we were talking about it last night. I had a group last night. About 60% of these guys will not make it through the whole thing because of this pressure they get, uh, not from the drug itself, but being uh, up here with their other druggies they hang out with. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say are the most important relationships in your life? Your life? <laughs> Well, family. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that little Freudian slip layer, slip there, important relationships in your wife. So that was. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. So what is your image of confession? A confessional box, dear Abby column, trusted friend, good for the soul, bad public relations. <laughs> Just some uh, thoughts because there will be a, there is a confession in here. I... All right, Rick, are you ready? I just, are one thing ready? I will say, dear Abby, yeah, uh, not for me, but my mother, a very strong Christian lady, but she loved reading that. It was just like, did you hear what she had to say today? <laughs> yeah, no, I remember. Yeah, is that even still that every printed anywhere? Did what? I said, is that even still printed anywhere? I mean, most. Of I don't think so. I was saying um, most of us don't even see newspapers anymore. So yeah, yeah. People would write in, you know, these questions, and this dear Abby was just phenomenal at answering them pretty quickly. In fact, but my mother just, I, not so much with me, but like with my father or even my grandparents or something, would say, "Did you hear what dear Abby?" There was like a thing, like see uh, yeah. the TV guide. If you read any of the stories in the TV guide this week, uh, yeah, yeah. these people were religious yeah. about reading those things. No, I, I think I remember, I do remember the, um, my mom and her sister and my grandmother. Yeah, I kind of overhear some of that 
Dear Abby stuff. And then <laughs> when she died, I think it kind of went away. It, yeah. Yeah. It left it on for a while. And I think somebody was writing in place of her and then it just kind of died out. And she had a great way of responding uh, to people's questions. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, people, she had a following, huge following. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nationwide, for sure. Yeah. Well, not before Twitter and all these other social. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, okay well, right. You, you answered the questions like she answered them. There'd probably be a protest in her front yard. Yeah. yeah. Every day. Every yeah. day. <laughs> all right, here we go. After being in Jerusalem for about five months, Ezra began to sense a deep need for revival among the people. He obviously had begun a teaching ministry among the people after they arrived, instructing them in the world of the Lord. Apparently, a spirit of conviction struck the hearts of some, and particularly the leaders. They came to Ezra confessing their sins. However, many of the people were not living lives of spiritual separation as commanded by God. They were engaging in the detestable, immoral, and wicked behavior of unbelievable unbelievers following the evil lifestyles and false worship of their neighbors. Note, the neighbors listed the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jezebites, Ammonites, Obites, Egyptians, and Moabites. Not only were these Jews committing immorality and wickedness, but some were also intermarrying with unbelievers. The children of Israel had forgotten the lessons that God had taught them through the fail, through the fall of their kingdom and 70 years of captivity. They had fallen back into the same sins that originally caused their downfall. All right. So, all right, Steve, it's just a couple of pages today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a whole lot of names in here, so praise Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my stomach and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord, my God, and prayed, oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than, the, than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings, as it is today. But now, O oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants and prophets, the prophets, when you said the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give our daughters, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our evil guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us? Leave us no remnant or survivor. O oh Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. 
Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. Hey, thanks, Steve, Rick. So any initial thoughts on the passage as we read through it? Yeah, when I always read this, I think of all our missionary work and the intermarriage that goes on sometimes. I mean, I even think about, if you've read anything about the, the book, The Mayflower and the uh, Native Americans. And uh, and when I did Ancestry Death Town with my wife, uh, side of the family, uh, there was intermarriage there with the Native Americans. And and uh, you, you look back at this and say that that was not encouraged, but yet we seem to become missionaries and 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 it's okay it's not you know where where you're looking at right here saying you know you don't want to do that you don't want to intermarry because that's that's an issue with god but later on we we seem to say that it is okay well like a lot of things we have changed as we've gone along yeah well don't marry a catholic you're a lutheran <laughs> hey, tony may take offense to that <laughs> I, I'm highly offended, Dr. Carson. <laughs> yeah, well, I was that was tongue in cheek. I think you know that. <laughs> I know. Good morning, family. Good morning. Morning. Okay, so there's several things in this passage kind of interesting and and as I going through part of this again. It's a struggle to know which translation to use, and uh, th this issue will come up uh, as we go through this. So, what three groups had not separated themselves from the heathens, according to the uh, first verse? Thanks for underlining it. <laughs> <laughs> So you can pick it out. It's not not all the answers are underlined. Some of them are underlined. Some are uh, are underlined for emphasis. So you'll have to be able to figure those out. What were the people of Israel doing that upset Ezra? Actually, if we look in verse two, it says they have yeah. taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons. And have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders of officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. So as I was looking at this verse and this question, uh, they kind of pointed me, they were using another, uh, the commentary is using another translation. And it says in uh, this one, so, so that the holy seed has become mixed with the surrounding peoples so why why did was ezra upset about this intermarrying you know that's a good question dwight i mean do we believe we're all created by god in god's image yes and this wasn't i mean Initially. You know, these people were not chosen by God. I mean, they're, I, I, what I think is that, I, I thought about, obviously, in my comments, is that there were those that were chosen as God's people, and there were those that were not. And you don't intermingle the two. Yeah. Well, and I think you need to look at the bigger picture in this translation. Does that give you any? So you're worried about Jesus and his pure offspring coming from the Israelites? Yeah, or follow right. the track. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, so, and you remember just since the very beginning in Genesis, it said, so, you know, Adam and Eve, your, your seed will crush the head of the serpent's seed. So, uh, that's kind of it's not it's not I you know when you read this you have some well, in fact because I just what we just watched something on on Netflix uh, that was about the Second World War and the Germans invading this uh, this in, invading France and and Paris and uh, 
So anyway, so when you think about intermarrying and the purity that that Hitler was looking for in the ideal, you know, the race, but so that that, that to me this the using the holy race kind of offset it then most of the other translations say holy seed, though which would point more to the, the lineage of Christ and that's what the whole thing about the, the chosen people like Gary was talking about. So anyway. By the time Ezra gets to verse three, how is he feeling and what actions indicate how he is feeling? So when he said, when I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard and sat down appalled. Oh, pissed. <laughs> He's what? He was still pissed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's you know, he's appalled uh yeah, all evening. So But they actually they, they he was when you talk about them, they did this to show their grief and their mourning and their dissatisfaction with the, the current situation. So that's how they uh communicated it by tearing their tunic and cloak and pulled out their hair and head and beard sat down and just yeah if you think about it if he were witnessing that you'd be stepping back three steps thinking oh, yeah <laughs> that'd be something to see it's hard enough plucking one little hair out of your yeah. head or whatever <laughs> yeah. i can't imagine pulling your beard apart and your hair out of your head <laughs> yeah, yeah you know and that's a, that also <clears throat> i don't know whether <clears throat> I just read or seen it somewhere too that, that that's what they did to Christ too when they huh. you know, his beard and yeah so <clears throat> so uh, in today's world if you had a tunic on you'd first have to figure out how much you paid for it before you ripped it off yeah yeah you might just take it off and hang it up. So verse uh, four is interesting, and I've got a question on that. So then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel <clears throat> gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exile. So verse four is interesting to me. So how, how do you react to that phrase? So everyone who trembled at the words of God, so trembling at the words of God. Well, let me read the rest of the question and see what I'm concerned about. So, so part of me feels that this is the issue, is part of the issue with this these generations that have been flippantly dismissed the word of God. They do not recognize his power, his authority. There is no fear. I know perfect love casts out all fear. It's not what I'm talking about here. But he is the creator of all things. And maybe a little trembling when he speaks is warranted. So, so I, I guess the thing that struck me is, is that no, no nobody uh, is trembling at the words of God, I guess. That's what my, nobody realizes that he's the creator. He's the Lord of all, all things. He is ultimately powerful. They're dismissing the consequences of, you know, not believing or following or practicing uh, uh, God's will. Uh, and I mean, we'll see a lot of that today where they, there isn't much thought about consequences of our actions. Yeah, exactly. And Ezra talks a lot about that uh, throughout this, this passage we've got here today, especially um, like he talks, you know, I, he, you know, our, our sins, our things that we've done uh, deserve more punishment. We realize that. We realize you're merciful, God. So I think I got some questions on that. But anyway, this, <clears throat> to me, I think if God, one thing, I guess, to get people back on track a little bit is God really showed his power. I think then people would really understand who he is. But, um 
So how would you uh, describe Ezra's attitude or demeanor in verse 6, which he says, so he fell on his knees, he tore his cloak, and they prayed, oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift my face up to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached the heavens. Well, I guess it says it right there. He's ashamed, he's disgraced. And I guess it's falling on his face. He's not even looking up to God. He's included himself in the statement instead of saying they. Yeah. Well, the one comment there's that he does start off on it on the first person and oh. then he then he does move to include everybody. So <clears throat> so what might be another way, and then you gotta think about this for a minute. To say our sins are higher than our heads. Uh, we're drowning in them? Yes. Uh, good, Steve. I wasn't sure if I was going to get that up. <laughs> <laughs> Your sins are above our heads, so we're drowning in them. So, so and then the, what's the next phrase? Uh, what about the second part of verse 6? Does this indicate that our sins are not hidden from God? Mm -hmm. yes so, so that was that would have been a yes or no question but yeah yes they were not hidden all right i'm struggling to get questions what, what was the result of the jews turning from god what was the result in verse seven we fall into other kings yeah Sword and captivity, pillage and humiliation. So, if there's America a book out right now, Dwight. That I know you like Jonathan Kahn. It's called "The Return of the Gods," and it really relates a lot to what that that sentence is about. About how in this world today, uh, we're we're turning to other gods. Uh, and so, I haven't even read it yet. I just. I, Debbie brought it home last night. She was in a bookstore and bought it for me. So I've got it laying here on my desk. But I did read the, the where you read the cover on the inside. Yeah. And uh, it's, that's basically right down the line of what we're talking about. No, and he, he's actually saying, though, that these gods are like, there would be fallen angels or demons, and they've continually you know, right. been... Uh, uh, after God's people and uh, trying to destroy God's people. And uh, so, yeah, we don't like to, as we think about this, what happened to the Jews at, every time when they turn from God and turn from their first love, uh, that they were in captivity and, uh, you know, like we just were talking about the people coming out of the, the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity, captivity and, um, uh, well, we, we think, well, we're, we're, we haven't been overtaken. We're, we're not taken into captivity, but uh, yeah, actually we, we have been. Uh, we look at the uh, the woke culture of today and, and, and the fact that uh, even back in the old days on how, um, not well, not the old days, I mean, 50 years ago when Roe v. Wade became the law of the land and how abortions just have grown and grown uh, we've become captivity to the culture and um, uh, a society that is definitely against God. In fact, wants to shut up Christians. So, when we look at the pilgrimage of go, moving and actually going out of Babylon into Jerusalem, and there were so few when we look at the numbers that actually left. But you think about in today's world, this similarity of the, then the highlighted of the intermarriage is that, you know, if you are that person that comes in and says to your wife who you intermarried with, and you say, we're going to Jerusalem, they say, well, you know, I'm not leaving my mother. We're staying here. And th that had to be going on. I mean, it was, it was really breaking families up to do what God was asking some of them to do, and they were not going to do it. They did not leave. 
why are people are so in, enthralled about the advantages or things that they gained in under the captivity? And you look at Lot's wife. I mean, although they were rescued, I mean, Abraham tried to negotiate with uh, God. I think I'm getting my names right. Abraham tried to negotiate with God to uh, to save Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, it got down to ten people, and there was only uh, Lot and his wife and family, and uh, so they had to leave. But then, after they got they got rescues taken out of there. I mean, Lot's wife was so kind of longing for what they'd had in. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah that she uh, turned and looked back. So, and I, there's another guy I follow too. They they did they have found in the the site where allegedly Sodom and Gomorrah were uh, balls of sulfur mm -hmm. that had had burned, fallen from the sky. So that's the only place in the world they've ever found those. Anyway, so I think I've got this down here for a minute. Okay, yeah. So you may want to, again, this translation was a little bit different uh, in verse 8. But now for a brief moment, grace has come from Yahweh, our God, to preserve a remnant <laughs> for us, give us a stake in his holy place. Even in our slavery, slavery God has given us new life and light to our eyes. Though we are slaves, our God has not abandoned us in our slavery. He has extended grace to us in the presence of the Persian kings, given us new life so that we can rebuild the house of God and repair its ruins to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. So obviously the underlining might have some meaning in answering one of these questions. Oh, here it is. Ezra spelled out seven facts that prove God's goodness was being showered on the returnees. What are they and how do you understand them? Understand the implication. So. And recall the sense here too that Israel's time in, in captivity was a disciplinary action, if you will, that God permitted. He didn't put them in captivity, but he permitted that uh, so that they would um, come back to him. But it wasn't a, a permanent punishment, I guess, in a certain sense. What kind of, what what are seven things you can pick up from uh, verses eight and nine that prove that uh, God's goodness and mercy kind of overshadowed even uh, during while he was exercising discipline? Preserve a remnant for us, give us a stake in this holy place, gave us new life and light in our eyes, not abandon us in our slavery, gave us new life again. Rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins and give us a wall. Yeah. Those are seven you're looking for since they're underlined. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yes. <laughs> but so, and actually we need uh, these things. Uh, we need a wall. <laughs> we need to rebuild the house of God and repair its ruins. I mean, we go through this if if you look. Um, and I think one of the, the reason I use this, and I may, I think I have a question if I'm trying to recall last night, but um, so, and again, the NIV, when it talks about now for a brief moment, moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant. So there's nothing uh, different, pre preserve a remnant, or what now, what I, I sometimes refer to the remnant as maybe the ecclesia of the true church of Christ. So, but here it says giving us a firm place in the NIV translation, but uh, here in the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, which I think we're using at Pilgrim, <coughs> if you look at those 
the translations in the lectionary, I mean, in the bulletin, but uh, so give us a stake in this holy place. Other places says, like, give the impression like he nailed the claim or nailed, nailed it to this holy place. So uh, I think firm place to me, this maybe not as a, uh, uh, strong a phraseology is giving us a stake putting like putting a stake in the ground uh, or, or nailing us uh, to this holy place so so Ezra is praying and thanking God for his grace and kindness now as Ezra and well this doesn't quite read well Ezra, in, and then in the message, he says, oh, the message, verse 10, let me read this over here. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands. In the message, it's, I was, sometimes it has some uh, clever things, it's uh, how it says it. And now, our God, after all this, what, we can say, what can we say for ourselves? For we have thrown your commands to the wind. So this kind of puts a little different perspective on. He then confesses some of the sins of the people. Like what? I don't think I underlined those. Uh oh. So what were some of the sins of the people? Well, I know it's hard. The detestable practices, uh, the impurities. Um, Intermarrying. Intermarrying, yeah. A treaty of friendship with the, them. So. <clears throat> so that you may be strong, need the good things of the land, leave it to your children. Um, so, yeah, what? Oh. As Ezra confesses and prays, what? does he come to realize in verse 13? Grace. Yeah. We didn't get what we deserved. Right. That punished us less than our sins have deserved. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, so when people, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I still recall a comment of somebody several years ago. <laughs> Not anybody in this group, but they say, well, you know, I really prefer the God of the New Testament over the God of the Old Testament. But you know, <laughs> he, he was the same, you know, he, he just there was punishment and discipline, not because he didn't love us, love the, the Israelites, but, uh, you know. Now, you know, like you punish us less than our sins deserve, so. I mean, I, I think um, even with uh, with our kids, I mean, sometimes you just want, you know, they just drive us to distraction. But uh, in, in our love, we just we just dis made discipline to get them going in the right direction. And uh, God could have completely destroyed them, but he let he gives a remnant. And so you kind of wonder about as you see some of the things God does in the Old Testament, when the people rebel and do these things like intermarrying with other pagan religions and uh, even Solomon, uh, you know, he was a, such a, a, a great king and God really certainly blessed him. He was the, the richest man in the world ever. If you uh, look at it in that perspective, but then he ended up taking all these wives and concubines and they brought a lot of, um, uh, things into uh, the kingdom and, and the people that uh, God did not like. So, so what is Ezra's fear, <clears throat> fear in verse 14? Going back to our old ways again. Yeah, and then what might be the result? Destroyed. Destroyed, completely wiped off the planet. So, with no remnant, no survivor. Well, 
what does this prayer tell you about which is greater guilt or grace slavish habits or new life god's anger or mercy Answer. grace new grace. life mercy yeah It goes back to where I think when people talk about the God of the Old Testament, New Testament, there is no difference at all. God has always have been a God of mercy, and, and uh, we get the ability to repent of our sins, but also the biggest thing is God has always loved us, and that has not changed at all. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. That's exactly, that's what we see through all these stories, even as... <clears throat> As terrible, rebellious, and uh, unappreciative the Israelites are, uh, God is still loving them through through it all. Yeah. And, and again, there there is discipline, e even you know, as we go through this. So, as I saw it, Ezra starts with the confession and praises God for His grace and mercy then more confession, then realizing God's discipline tempered again and again with grace and mercy. Uh, what was the question here? What was I? Uh, I think the question I, I was looking at was on as we go through this on um, is Ezra's prayer format here something that we could use or we should use or what do you think about how we how we go through this prayer it's, that's great right that you you think of the question and you write the answer yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know well you know it's it's a struggle at times so um <laughs> I well, that's, that's how you would pray for the nation right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um so one of the commentaries and i'll go through this it's not a, it's a question that Sometimes I read these commentaries. I mean, I've got some some favorites that I use, and uh, uh, they always give a, a help uh, in, enlighten it or elucidate the passage. And uh, but then sometimes they go off on a tan tangent that is uh, not quite where I'm at. And again, that doesn't to me. It's like when we we have even in this group. We have different opinions uh, on different aspects of our faith. Uh, so it, it doesn't, in my mind, it, it doesn't discount uh, anything you've said or the validity, but we're just on a different page. So, but I had some trouble with this commentary, which uh, I'm going to show you below. And it even had some verses, well, they had more verses than I showed to kind of support their their take on it. So. Again, this is from one of the commentaries, and I want your thoughts as I, I read that, uh, read this. So it says, confession is an absolute essential to receive forgiveness of sins. Therefore, when we sin, we must confess before God. Failure to confess means that we bear the guilt of sin ourselves. Picture a person who breaks the law of the land. <clears throat> for his violation, he must pay the stated or agreed upon penalty for his violation or else be forgiven for his disobedience. Likewise, when we break the law of God, we must seek his forgiveness or else bear the guilt and punishment ourselves. And God is unwavering about the punishment. Thus, confessing our sins is the key to escaping God's coming judgment. And then these are just some of the verses that they for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Throw off all transgressions you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and new spirit why should you die O house of israel so so what were your initial thoughts when i read this thought one 
were any of you troubled by the way this they phrase this and the way they talk about confession here? Yeah. Okay, what bothered you? It's 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 not in my opinion, it's not confession, it's repentance. Which is an you know, and confession's part of that. Right? And then yeah. asking for God to help you, you know, give you the strength to to turn from that evil behavior and help guide you. I mean, it's not, it's not you, it's him working through you. Okay. That's part of what I got out of that too. So anybody else have, how does my, my question is whether, um, asking God for forgiveness is enough. Um, if you sin against somebody else and you ask God for forgiveness, is it not the right thing to go to the person you sinned against and say, hey, I'm sorry I did this? So I, apart from asking God for forgiveness, our earthly counterparts, I think it's the right thing. If you stole something from somewhere, you return it and ask for forgiveness. I don't want to ask for forgiveness and still keep the money I stole, or the person I yeah. yelled at or yeah. insulted, leave that person highly um, sad, and then ask for forgiveness and move on with life. So I think it's a two-prong thing. Yeah. No, I, I would point. agree with that too. That's still still not the part that was, uh, I mean, I agree. Those are all good. And Tony, you had a, a great one to add to this too. I think that's in confession in the light of what Tony's talking about is actually a two-part process. And right, not only asking to God to forgive you, but going to the person that you sinned against us, which is much like we do in the Lord's Prayer, too. So, um, so and this is uh, Romans 6.23 is to me, when I look at it, is a throwback to Genesis is when you, you, know, you got to accept the fact that we are sinners and the wage of sin is death through, through your spirit. You get from that, which is a gift of God. You can uh, have eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, so somebody else. I mean, these are all good things, but it's not particularly what bothered me when I read this. But these are these are all excellent things and um, some things I hadn't thought about. But I guess when I read this initially, I was. But I want to hear anybody else have an impression of this interpretation or about confession. Well, I mean, the forgiveness is always there, right? God's yeah. always willing to forgive. This is a if you can why confess. why you know what I mean. I mean why? Because of Christ, Christ's death yes. on the cross, right? He paid. He's paid for all the sins. So the way you read the first verse can be construed incorrectly. It's an if-then, and it's not an if-then. Grace is not an if-then, right? It's abounding. It's everywhere. It's always available. So I guess what, what got me, I guess, and then see what you guys uh, think. So it, it is, is for us, this side of, accepting Christ, the side of accepting Christ's payment for all our sins. Yeah, we need to confess our sins. We need to go to the person we sinned against and, and uh, confess and ask for forgiveness. But the thing for us, those who've accepted Christ, confession actually enables us to feel more comfortable in going to God because we, we know that, uh, Christ is forgiveness of our sins. We're no longer sinning to death. We're working to sin less, as I talked about in the email. Um, but confession it heals our relationship with God because some, when we sin against him, without we're, we're thinking that, well, we can't really go to God. Uh, we can't be close to him because this sin kind of separates mm -hmm. us because we know we have a great debt. So, but when we ask for forgiveness, we understand that that debt's already been paid and it improves our relationship with God. So uh, I think what struck me is it, it doesn't say anything about 
that we, we we're not concerned about God's the coming, coming judgment. judgment. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that that was that was the thing that just kind of struck me uh, on the way they they put this because uh, somebody would be thinking that, and I think there was this the thought in in the church for a long time is that if you do die without having any, uh, confessing for every sin. Uh, then you're going to hell. That's what the implication is here. On the surface, when I read it, maybe not to anybody else. But um, so Christ took all our punishment and the judgment that was rightly ours. And if we there's some sin that maybe we forgot about or didn't strike us as a, being that bad. Um, I mean, anyway, that's they're saying any any sin. If you don't confess every sin, uh, you're doomed. But there are some sins that you're not even aware of yourself. Other people can see it, but you're not even aware of it. But Christ right. took care of those too. Yes, I mean that that was this discussion kind of. That's what I, I was thinking about. Just it, it just puts a burden on us, which I don't think uh, God or Christ wants us. I mean, we do need to confess. We do need to repent. <clears throat> and, uh, but, you know, this, this would put a, a fear upon us. What if I didn't confess uh, every sin? I mean, uh, maybe in, in, you know, when we pray, we can say, God, forgive me of all the sins, even those, those ones I knew about and the ones I don't know about, maybe that would cover it, but it's, it's not up to us to uh, um, recall every sin and in order for us to be saved. I guess, anyway, that's kind of what, uh, maybe I put too much on this uh, commentary, but that just, it just kind of um, got to me a little bit. Yeah, I guess the, the last part should say something like, confessing our sins is a key component to developing our relationship with God or exactly right mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah the confession of sin too is in my you know it's uh i hate the word general but in general you know we are sinners and uh, i don't know that we've talked about this you can put a weight on any one individual sin we just are sinners period yeah and that when you look in the book of james i think it's chapter five there's a lot about we, we when we talk about judgment, we don't even have a right to, we don't have that right to judge sin. Uh, only God does that. Right. And, right. Uh, so if we recognize that we're sinners, that's the first step. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, to deny the fact that we're sinners and not a, ask for any rep repentance is the wrong step. So uh, I, I don't know that we look at, you know, when you look at man's law and God's law, uh, that we go through individually and say, well, you know, I think I forgot that. You know, I, I lied about that. I should probably uh, confess that sin. And it, it's in general, uh, more or less, that we are sinners and we need to accept that fact. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, again, that um, just shows you sometimes I read these the, the commentary and I'm, I'm going, well, this is great. This really... Uh, enlightens me and then i come across this and i'm going well, wait a minute i'm not quite on that same page but again it doesn't um diminish the value that i get out of the commentary so um but th there are things that i'm not uh on the 100 percent in the same place that they are so um anyway so i just threw, threw that out there so kind of share with you some of the things i go through as i'm uh looking at the the lesson and um again so yeah they had all these verses here i mean and then there's many many more this um um it's called it's a preacher's commentary or something but they have multiple multiple uh, uh verses um but you know we could look at this from just the context that we've been talking about from our perception of confession and but you know, as we read these um, in the light of being uh, uh, this side of uh, salvation. Um, anyway, so sorry, enough on that, I suppose. 
Um, so even within the church today, many are found to be caught up in the possessions and pleasures of the world and in its corrupt, immoral, and wicked behavior. If the church has ever needed a revival, it is today. And then this is from the same commentary, but believers are to be spiritually separated from the wicked and evil of this earth. We are not to participate in the sinful worldly behavior of unbelievers with immorality, gossip, hatred, greed, and covetousness, lying, stealing, cheating, and all other sinful behaviors are not to be a part of our lifestyle. If neighbors, fellow workers, classmates, or relatives engage in such wicked behavior, we must not follow in their steps. We are to take a strong stand for righteousness, morality, and peace. When dealing with immorality and unrighteousness, we are to live lives of spiritual separation, having nothing to do with wicked behavior. God does not expect us to become extremists to isolate ourselves from fellow workers, classmates, and neighbors. In fact, he commands us to be witnesses to the lost of the world and to disciple them, which involves associating with them. But God's instructions are clear. We must not fellowship and socialize with the wicked of this earth. If we socialize with them, eventually they will seduce and influence us to participate in their wicked and immoral behavior. Again, peer pressure that we kind of talked about earlier. Note what the Holy Scriptures says. And again, I looked at the couple translations. The message is always uh, a little bit uh, interesting too. But be on your guard. Don't let the sharp edge of your expectation get dulled by the parties and drinking and shopping. Otherwise, the day is going to take you by complete surprise, spring on you suddenly like a trap, for it's going to come on everyone everywhere at once. So whatever you do, don't go to sleep at the switch. Pray constantly that you will have the strength and wits to make it through everything that's coming and end up on your feet before the Son of Man. So the reason, again, uh, the Ezra is so upset about the foreign marriages is because such pagan alliances meant that the people had broken faith with their covenant with God. The God who had called them out from among all nations to the, of the earth to be his own special people and to be a regenerating element in the world. So, again, it kind of comes back to this thing, and I think this is the thing. Um he wants his people to be salt and light. And we've talked about that before too. Had these marriages with idolatrous wives been allowed to continue unchecked, the Jews would eventually have been absorbed in the surrounding mass of paganism. And God's purpose would have been frustrated. Israel is meant to be a separated people. Ezra is right, therefore, to react the way he did. So, any other comments on uh, the passage today? Okay. Uh, any updates or changes? I, I did. Uh, Dave Marshall, you know, has got pancreatic cancer, and his first set of uh, chemo and surgery went extremely well. And he starts a uh, new uh, chemo again. I think it was on Wednesday. Um, a new new session to check for any uh, lingering cancer cells, I guess. Um, Joe Travis, that I've been trying to uh, get on, he's not going to uh, Pete's uh, because he has to uh, do drain issues and management with uh, Marilyn with the her duct thing, which I think some of you might remember was yeah. been an ongoing issue. So uh, uh, keep Marilyn and, and uh, Joe in our prayers. He he tells me he was going to uh, uh, try and uh, drop in on uh, sometime. But uh, again, even back when we were meeting in person, it took him years before he showed up at the sunrise because uh, he was not a, morning, a six o'clock yeah. person. So uh he gave me that same excuse when I re-invited him. So he he's he's been uh, he's been sharing me the uh, kind of updates on uh, Dave Marshall. So great. 
I, I got to tell you, I know it's probably automatic, but I, since I left many years ago now, over 10 years ago, I still get a daily uh, Bible verse from Joe uh, every day. Yep. Yeah. Every single day. One in the morning and one in the evening. Yeah. yeah. So that's something his sister did started. I don't know. I, I ran into him at Georgie's uh, uh, funeral service and Marilyn was there too. And he, I, I asked him about that. And he's like, that's something my sister had started like 40 something years ago and he, that I just kind of picked it up in the last few years and started doing it. So, yeah. I would like, to, uh, there's a lady by the name of Casey and it's with K. K A S E Y. Um, she has cancer and severe, but uh, what's interesting is I had a gentleman that went through our program who was an addict and an alcoholic and his daughter refused to have him come back home. And, and with that all being said, we worked through all that. He's you no, know, he's actually working for my son now at a construction company. And uh, I mean, everything's looking so good for him. And uh, his daughter finally accepted him. He moved back in the home. The home was all good. And then just within the last couple of weeks, they found out that uh, uh, his wife has two brain tumors. Oh, so you, you you look at that and say, wow, I'm feeling so good for him and everything's happening right for him. And he's doing the right stuff. And and then God's testing me in a different way. And and uh, so he's going through some tough time. And uh, we're working hard that, you know, as I told you before, we know that through depression, uh, that you turn to drugs or alcohol, which he has done in the past, he's doing really well. So we would, I prayers for his wife uh, who has cancer and prayers for him. His name is Frank. Okay. And then I want to add uh, Nathan who's the husband of one of my wife's coworkers. Uh, they're not believers. I just, uh, they found a mass and uh, we don't know the details yet. They're not believers. So I just pray that uh, my wife can uh, serve as a witness uh, and a light in this world to them that they might know Christ. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Any, uh, how's uh, Debbie doing with, sleep and everything uh she's getting better and I, I smile because you know the doctor i think i don't know if i told you i did tell one of my bible study groups i just he said that she could probably start trying to drive take her to a big parking lot and and uh, let her drive a little bit and see how that works because it's her right leg her right knee so very important in driving the right leg yeah, yeah. and uh yeah. so yesterday we went to a parking lot and i i and i was really kidding with her but she took it I said, well, before we get started, would you mind? I'm going to get out of the car and I'll watch you from a bit. <laughs> <laughs> she said, what? I said, well, you know, uh, for safety purposes, I think I'm going to watch you from the outside. <laughs> and But I didn't. And we drove around and she did, she did fairly well. But uh, she, well, the bad thing about it is if you start to get what she calls zingers, you start to get these sharp pains in your leg and you oh. just kind of wait until they go away. So she's still having those. So uh, I think she's a little early. She should drive away when I'm around, but uh, not alone yet. Yep. Yeah. So that, you know, remind me, you're taking the kids out to the empty parking lot when they, to kind of get them started on driving sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Right. That I don't know. You're talking about the right leg, and uh, I remember when I was, we were little, my sister and I would uh, ride with my grandmother. It was after my grandfather died, but uh, she would drive with a foot on the brake and a foot on the accelerator. So it was, <laughs> no, like that all the time. So oh. until they finally uh, told her she couldn't drive anymore. So <laughs> till her brakes went out. <laughs> well, yeah, but the, yeah, to put us in a car with her. With no no other adult, but anyway, so <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that was a thing. More, I don't see it as much, but that was a thing. Maybe if, in those days, but you you could tell because the brake lights never went off. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They always had their brake lights on. 
<laughs> well, it's probably a carryover from when everybody had a clutch too. So yeah, yeah. both yeah. feet at all at all times. So and don't you love following somebody who does it that way? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Um, okay. Uh, let's spend a moment in prayer here. Dearly Father, I thank you so much for, for these guys and for the time that we have together to discuss your word. It, it always uh, enlightens and, and adds to my my week and uh, I'm just blessed by the, this time with them. Um, and we thank you, Father, for that. Um, Father, there's a lot of things going on, man. Uh, we, we think about the the people on our list and and um, and Joe's wife and 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 this we just learned Frank and his wife and and Nathan um, and what he's going through and uh, Father we we know you are the healer uh, the great healer and it, it just uh, seems to to us Father as we look at this from our perspective that wow what a great testimony this would be if if Nathan was brought healing and uh, in, in a miraculous way and um uh, and, uh, for any of these folks father we just ask you to reach out and and let your healing touch um, continue to be with them remove all, all pain from uh, uh debbie's uh, uh leg and surgery and and we just uh, are, are blessed by what we hear brad's recovery and and father that's just um we want to continue to see your work and uh, oh, please don't don't be shy please show yourself so your miraculous miracles and your healing and, and things for the people on our list um we also ask father uh, man our, our country and the world is actually in a turmoil uh, evil is so prevalent uh, we ask for your protection we ask for your restoration much as you came to those in the stories that we've been reading in the old testament how Israel, even though as a nation they had fallen away from you and they um, uh, in some cases even cursed you and and uh, just failed to do uh, what they knew was the right thing to do to honor you. But uh, Father, as a nation, we have done that too. We just um, Ask for your forgiveness and restoration. Uh, give us another chance to be the light and salt of the world. Thank you, God. 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 So, Father, just be with us, be with our families. We ask for your protection and your provision uh, as we move forward. And, uh, uh, Thank you for the blessing of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, so, Dwight. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Dwight. Dwight. Yeah. Thank you. So next week, uh, Steve will be doing lesson. Uh, we'll take a break from... Uh,